Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today I would like to tell you something about subrings and ideals. More with the focus on ideals because the notion of subring is kind of obvious. Um, but they are both valid kind of substructures things. And the story is very similar to the one that you might have seen from subgroups and normal subgroups. It's a very similar story, but just in the in the in the uh, in ring theory, not in a group theory. In particular, the overall picture looks kind of the same. So whenever you study a certain type of structure, might it be a vector space or a group or whatever, or in this case a ring, um, it kind of makes sense to look at substructures and. What are substructures? Well, you take a subset and on that subset, you still have the induced operations. Like for, for a ring, you would have addition and multiplication. And yeah, addition and multiplication give you two new operations or the same operations on the subset. And you would demand that it's kind of closed under those operations. And you would call it a substructure. In other words, you take a subset, you have an induced multiplication, whatever, addition, and you're still of the same type. In this case, you're still the same ring. And that's pretty nice. That's, that's my main motivation or the only motivation I really give you to study subrings, which correspond to subgroups, as I said, or to linear subspaces or whatever. Um, that's the main motivation, right? Studying substructures can't be wrong. It turns out that there's something different you can do you always want to take quotient that's like identifying information. And yeah, if you take a quotient by a subring, you don't have necessarily uh, a nice multiplication structure, structure on the quotient. And that's kind of what's missing. That's the same what happens for groups. So if you have a, a group and you take just the quotient by a subgroup, you usually don't get kind of an induced group structure on the quotient. That's why you come up with the notion of normal subgroup. Um, for a vector space, you are fine. For a vector space, there is not really a difference. But in most cases, there actually is a difference. And here, we will see a difference. And that's where the notion of ideal comes up. So ideals really come up as by the idea of, of forming quotient. OK, so let me take this idea of quotient a step further by kind of claiming that ideals generalize divisibility. So what is divisibility? Well, so let me just look at the divisibility by eight, just because I like eight. So here's eight. This notation just means eight z are all numbers that are divisible by eight. In other words, it's something like minus 16, minus eight, uh, zero, eight, 16, and so on. And they form an ideal in the following sense. So the first thing you observe is that the additive unit, which is zero, is actually divisible by eight. Okay. Um, in contrast, beware, beware. This is something that is a bit confusing. You do not, for ideals, usually do not take the multiplicative unit. And you see why, because one is not divisible by eight, of course, right? So the multiplicative unit in Z, now good old friend, the integers, uh, would be one, but it's certainly not divisible by eight. And if you want to generalize divisibility, then it's not a good idea to take one. Um, at, at least if you want to generalize divisibility by eight. Um, and then you have two very similar looking properties, but they are still pretty different. So if you have two numbers that are divisible by eight, you can add them and you get a number that is divisible by eight. I call it internal addition. You can't at by a number that is not divisible by eight. For example, a very easy eight plus one. So eight is divisible by eight. Eight plus one is certainly not divisible by eight, which is nine, right? So you can't do that, but you can still, you can add two uh, numbers that are divisible by eight. Okay, I call this internal. In contrast, in, for multiplication, you don't care. Eight times one is still divisible by eight. That's why for multiplication, I want to have this property of actually a, a stronger property um, of having ex being externally closed. Like you can multiply everything from your ring, in, in this case, Z to, um, to 
to, to a number that is divisible by eight and you still get a number that is divisible by eight. And the way I would like to illustrate this, and this is kind of a standard thing, is in those diagrams, which you read from top to bottom. So you have something big at the bottom, uh, where big is very re re relative here because everything is infinite anyway, but I think you get the point. You have something small at the bottom and you have inclusion along those um, edges. But numbers that are divisible by two are certainly integers, so they're in here. Numbers that are divisible by four are certainly also divisible by two and so on. And you get this lattice of ideals. Okay, basically that's how I want to like to think about ideals. For ideals, there's some slight catch that comes into the game. So usually things are not commutative and you have to differentiate between left and right. So let's have a look at left and right. I claim ideals also generalize row and column operations. So the idea is as follows. So if I only care for this last property from a certain site, which doesn't make any difference in Z, but for example, in matrices, it makes a difference. So let's say I only care about external left or external right multiplication, right? Then I claim if you take a row matrix, this is a row matrix, and you multiply it by anything, this is the thing in my ideal. So here, this is a column matrix, this is this thing in my ideal. And this beast here is the thing in R. Thing in R. And if you multiply the things from the right side, then you actually stay in your ideal, right? You stay in your ideal. Um, even though I haven't defined for you what an ideal is yet, it kind of makes sense. But of course, just check it in your head. The zero matrix certainly is a row matrix or a column matrix. Um, if you add two row or column matrices, you get the matrix of the same type. And I just showed you that multiplication, um, at least if you be a little bit careful with left and right, that multiplication is also um, preserved by, by rows or columns. Right, note that, and that's kind of the crucial point. In general, this is not two sided. So if I take the other color, if I take my uh, column matrix that multiply from the right instead of from the left, the other way around, from the left instead of from the right, then I, I basically get everything. So my, my ideal structure is kind of my external multiplication is kind of, kind of lost. Okay, and if you take those analogies seriously, they would end up with the following definitions. Uh, don't don't look too closely. It's basically repetition. So those are basically the same as we will see. Anyway, um, so subring is exactly what you think it is. It's a substructure, so it forms a ring, the subset that forms a ring under the induced multiplication. Uh, an ideal then depends whether it's two-sided, it's left or right. And the only difference is um, that you either have this property, so left and right multiplication stay in I external, keep that in mind, uh, left or right, but not the other one stays in I. And always um, it's, it's a subgroup under addition. Okay, so the multiplication is really, um, is really what changes here. And if you want to take something, well, have to a little thought about it in, from a matrix examples, for example, um, this, this is again vastly different. So matrices have usually a, a lot of sufferings, but not many ideals. Uh, link in the, is in the description if you want to wonder about um, left and right ideals and matrices. The answer is pretty nice. They're basically columns and rows, uh, not quite, as you will see. But anyway, so this is exactly the formal definition, right? So and it's motivated by this div divisibility. Um, and here's, let me finish with again those lattice pictures because they are pretty nice. And here's a very important proposition, theorem, whatever you want to call it. Basically there's certain sub-correspondence, uh, a certain one-to-one -one correspondence um, from the lattice picture in the ring itself, if you truncate it at a certain ideal to the quotient. So if you have an ideal, the whole point is you can form the quotient ring and in the quotient, the substructure looks exactly the same. Right? So this lattice structure is preserved um, undertaking quotients. Formally, if you have subring, say, uh, S, which is sandwiched, so this one, for example, sandwiched, which, sandwiched between R and I, then you can look at this image 
and it's still sandwiched between the corresponding things. And it's exactly that's the same position as before. Similarly, let for first one J, um, let's say this one, it's sandwiched, sandwiched between. Very useful correspondence. So it also tells you a little bit that um, ideals and lattices are actually very closely related. Anyway, I'm already about to start waffling, so I should just wrap it up. So sub rings are exactly the structures you think they are. They are just the rings under the induced multiplications and addition. And the notion of an ideal comes from this idea of divisibility or well, then more general maybe of this idea to have um, an induced structure on the quotients. Uh, the only kind of satellite catch with ideals is that you a little bit have to, have to be a little bit careful with left and right. But otherwise, it's, it's a pretty natural notion. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.